on camera. Good morning. Today is June 1st, 2022, and my name is Kurt Mueller. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Joe Buckner, also a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. Bill Schachter, who served in the United States Army Special Forces during the Vietnam War. Mr. Schachter is oral history is being recorded for the Atlanta History Center Veterans History Project in partnership with the Library of Congress. We're honored to have you with us today, Bill, and thank you for participating in this project. To begin with, would you please state your full name and your date of birth? William D. Schachter, uh, 4742, born in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Grew up in a place called Cedars, New York, which is a uh, suburb of New York City. Maybe to start with, why don't you give us a little bit of background of, uh, you mentioned where you were born, about growing up, school, up until the time when you went into the service. Anything about your family you want to share with us as sure. well, too? Uh, I grew up uh, and uh, as a young kid was interested in cowboys industry, in, in, in Indians in war, uh, sports, of course. Um, and then um, later on, I uh, got very interested in history and loved reading fiction, nonfiction books about different battles, wars, etc. cetera. Um, family history, uh, I had a great uncle who served in World War I. Uh, he took the place of his brother-in-law. He was gassed in uh, France and he came back and his brother-in-law collected his disability. He, he never got anything for that. I had a, an uncle who was uh, with the Third Armor and uh, crossed the Rhine with Patton. And I had a brother who did ROTC, transportation officer, uh, went in for six months. Uh, they had that at that time. And then the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis came along and they extended him for a year and they sent the son of a, to France <laughs> for the missile crisis. Uh, and around that time, of course, uh, you know, we were faced with the draft and I didn't want to go in as enlisted, so I always thought about going in as an officer. And after, you know, being interested in all this stuff about war, I desired to be a, um, a recon platoon leader up on the uh, border of Germany and Poland, Czechoslovakia looking at the Russians. Uh, I went to the University of Rhode Island, land-grant college. Uh, ROTC was mandatory, uh, so I did my two years. I was specialized in collecting gigs for uh, not cleaning my rifle, polishing my shoes, etc. Uh, but I had a, a great instructor, his name was Jonathan Swift, captain. And he took a liking to me, so he just gave me C's. Uh, our advanced course was uh, divided into three branches. We had uh, engineer, quartermaster, and infantry. Of course, wanting to be a uh, recon platoon leader, I chose the infantry when I went to the advanced course. And as you know, uh, at the end of your junior year, you went for six weeks uh, training, which was basically basic training. Out of uh, 49 people, uh, I tied for 48th. Uh, kept up with my persona. Uh, anyway, uh, after I get back from that, I get a letter from the um, RTC department saying I had to go before school started to, in front of a board to see if they'd let me continue. Uh, and uh, I go up to school, and who is now the head of the board is Major Jonathan Swift. And so uh, I went, continued on uh, to graduate. So you're looking at somebody probably you've never seen almost flunked out of ROTC. I don't know that that's, anybody's capable of doing that, but I certainly reached that. And you may be wondering, with that kind of record, how did this happen? Okay. And uh, therein lies the story, folks. So I graduated June 64. Second Lieutenant, orders were to report to active duty um, February 26, 1965. 
Um, and so for those ensuing months before I went to active duty, uh, I went out to Aspen, Colorado, ski bummed. That's another story. Some of that is classified. Uh, and uh, reported in to uh, IOBC uh, that February. We had, I think, 180 in the class. My orders after that were to go to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, as a training officer. There goes being a uh, second lieutenant, recon platoon leader, gone. Okay. And uh, Columbia, South Carolina was, in those days, sorry folks, was not the garden spot of the world, okay? especially coming from New York. Anyway, uh, off to IOBC, uh, about the sixth or seventh week, uh, they told us to report to the auditorium at six o'clock, didn't tell us why, and uh, so school ended, I think, 4.30, happy hour, beers were 15 cents or something like that, had a few, <laughs> a burger, felt really, really loose going to uh, the auditorium, 180 of us are there. Out walks a guy, Daniel Boone. Uh, he had a coonskin hat. Uh, he had uh, deerskin clothing, moccasins, flintlock rifle, hatchet in his side. He's from the range department. And he's recruiting people to go to ranger school, which starts the day after we finish IOBC, coincidentally. Okay. Um, he's followed by a uh, captain comes out with a steel helmet, a uh, chin strap, parachute on his back, reserve on his front, um, you know, uh, creased uh, fatigues, uh, spit shine Cochrane boots. He's recruiting for the airborne department. And I had an epiphany. I said, you know, if I do this, forget how hard it is, didn't matter. If I do this and get through, Man, I'm going 82nd on 101st Airborne, all right. Well, <clears throat> off we go to uh, Ranger Department. We uh, report in. First thing you do is everybody removes their, their rank. You have no rank, you're just a Ranger. I had no idea how tough this was going to be. I got lucky. Um, one reason is, is that uh, in my platoon, was a 50-ish year old full colonel from the, the Pentagon. And he was reviewing ranger training. And he did everything we did during the first couple of works physically. And although every five or 10 minutes you wanted to quit, you look and see this 50-year-old, he's doing this stuff, I, go, I can't quit. And I learned an important lesson, you know, don't quit. It, it, and it lasted for a lifetime, that, that lesson. The second lucky thing that happened to me was um, the third week of um, the bending phase, uh, we started doing patrolling, and the first patrol leader uh, appoints me as the point man. And uh, knowing in the infantry, nobody wants to be in a point, but I certainly didn't. But okay, I'm the point man, and I got lucky because being the point man, I was involved in everything going on. And uh, as opposed to the guys in the back who were zombiesque, you know, I mean, they're sleeping, they're exhausted. And, uh, you know, we stop, I'd go back, I'd listen to the instructor criticize, which is all he did. The only thing they did is criticize you, you know. <laughs> and when it came time for me to uh, take my position as patrol leader, I was ready to go. So, um, I got through this out of uh, 160, 80 from IOBC and 80 more they brought in, 47 graduated out of 160. Um, and uh, then off we go to airborne school. Now after nine weeks of ranger school, airborne school was easy. That's the only way I could describe it. There's no, no big deal. Uh, and then uh, for a couple of people, new orders came down. Um, 20 of the 47 were assigned to the uh, first CAV, um, which went over, and this was the summer of uh, 66, 65. Uh, and so these guys are going to first CAV, and I guess in October they went off to Vietnam. Um, of course, the Idrang Valley, big battle, a lot of people got killed, a lot of guys I knew got killed. 
um, and you read about it in the Stars and Stripes. Uh, one of those, by the way, involved, and by the way, I'm still going to Fort Jackson. <laughs> you know, didn't matter Airborne Ranger. I'm still going to Fort Jackson, but one of those guys uh, was a guy named Joe Marm, and Joe got the Medal of Honor for the Battle of Vidrang Valley. I saw him recently on a YouTube thing. He was um, in a pan on a panel, and he said, my original orders were to go to Fort Jackson. <laughs> I said, thank you, Joe. You took my place, I guess. Yeah, you know. So uh, off I go to Fort Jackson and um, report in, and my first commander is a captain, Japanese-American, he had been with the 7th Special Forces Group out of Okinawa, had done six-month TDY in Vietnam in the 64, 63 timing. And his name, I cannot make this up, folks, Suit M. Jew, J-E-W. And I put it in, I said, a Jew, I'm the Jew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... Anyway, I served with him, and he was replaced by a guy named Robert Fouché, Captain VMI graduate. My principal duties was to oversee training. And by the way, having I realized that having that Airborne Ranger tab separated you from a lot of other people. Uh, the EM enlisted sergeants looked at me in a much different light, treated me much differently. Um, and... Um, you know, they, they did all the training, I supervised, but I had a specialty. And my specialty was that every um, group that came in of 150 to 60 uh, basic trainees, uh, five to seven were problems. A lot were overweight, couldn't keep up, and s a couple were just didn't want to be there. Um, <coughs> the overweight guys, I would stand behind them in the chow line when it came to the the fattening stuff, I shake my head to the server. <clears throat> uh, with the other guys, the, the, uh, the EMs were pretty good with the attitude, but the, we had one guy, I'll never forget, uh, he was a real problem. And uh, the third week, the first two weekends they didn't get off. The third weekend they got, I think, Saturday afternoon off. And, um, and so uh, we had uh, Reveille in the morning, company formation. I called this guy out. Now all these kids were waiting to get out for the afternoon. They had a pass, base pass. A lot of them had uh, parents, friends, whatever, visiting. Called this kid out front and center. And I said, because of you, passes are canceled. <laughs> You're confined <laughs> to the company area. Okay. Uh, uh, first sergeant dismissed the company. He comes up. He has this big shit-eating grin on his face. He was just, you know, wow, what did you do here, Captain? You know, you're lieutenant. I said, well. And so uh, I don't know what they did to this kid, but I got to tell you, he wasn't a problem after that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> And um, during that time, uh, I got promoted to first lieutenant because my data rank was June 64. So 18 months, you get automatic promotion. And um, I decided I wanted to go into special forces. That I had, I don't know, maybe survivor's guilt because I'm reading about all these guys I knew were getting KIA'd. Um, all of these troops, they're going to Vietnam, most of them. And so I said to the Army, I'll cut you a deal. Uh, if you send me special forces, I'll go indefinite, which was a minimum of one year commitment. Well, they didn't have any problem with that. <laughs> I get orders to report to Fort Bragg to go to PSYOP school of the special warfare, okay? And then on to fifth group Vietnam. Uh, my parents freaked. Uh, they uh, and I said to my mom, I said, "Mom, look, I'm going to psyop school. That means I'm going to be on a staff somewhere. And I'm going to throw leaflets out, making you know, <clears throat> what do you call it? I'm you know, broadcasting stuff. Don't worry." And she said, "Every time you tell me to worry, I worry. Don't worry, I worry." Okay. So I go through the. Uh, 
So I warfare school, and December 10th, I land at Tonsonut Airport. And uh, the only thing I remember about landing was uh, prior to landing, the captain gets on and he says, um, because of ground for fire, a potential ground fire, we're going to come in steep and flare out and land. You know, mm, okay. So we land, no problem. I don't remember being overtly hot or anything like that, but um, there is a reception area, special forces, um, a couple of NCOs. Stay there overnight. Next next uh, day, I go up to Natrang, special forces headquarters. <coughs> I'm told to um, go to the BOQ, which is really a barracks with some cots, and uh, report to the uh, S-1 the next day, next morning. Right. Sitting in one of the cots <coughs> is a captain who had just come out of the field. He had been with the uh, mountain yards, and uh, his left arm had these silver bracelets <laughs> from here to his wrist. These are friendship bracelets. And I heard later on that he married a Montagnard lady and they thought he got too friendly, so they pulled him out. Anyway, I report the next day and uh, S1 says, uh, you gotta meet the commander, Colonel Kelly. Okay. I walk in, meet Colonel Kelly, Colonel Kelly, full colonel. He is from the Bronx, New York. Had a Bronx accent realizes, you know, I'm from New York, I'm Jewish, and he starts talking Yiddish to me. Now, Yiddish is <laughs> a combination of Hebrew and German, and we're going back and forth a little bit, <laughs> okay? It's very funny. Uh, and uh, then he says, okay, go see this one. You'll get your assignment. I said, great, you know? So I go out, and the um, S1 says to me, the XO of A331, <coughs> Uh, Shantan in three corps shot himself in the foot. You're his replacement. Uh, sound familiar, Joe? <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, <coughs> so I said, but, 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 but he says, oh, and by the way, uh, after you get there in about two weeks, three weeks, uh, you're moving and you're going to build the first fully designed fighting camp. And you're going to be um, in a spot which is going to interject, inter inter interject uh, the flow of traffic between, between War Zone C and War Zone D. Good luck, Lieutenant. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Off I go to Shantan, and the um, team leader is John Horn, Captain. John is from Alabama. And John had been an enlisted NCO, went to OCS, now he's captain. Um, didn't smile a lot, uh, but we got along. And uh, anyway, two, three weeks go by, and we're loading out everybody. We had about 350 troops, equipment, and so on and so forth. My job is to make sure everything gets loaded out and moved. And, and so, that goes smoothly. Uh, when I get to where the, the camp was, they had cut out a small clearing. In the middle of a clearing of the clearing was all kinds of ammunition boxes stacked up. And we are, the team is positioned around that. <laughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> further out is our troops. And there's another uh, defensive line further than that, which is a Mike Force that had come in to help us uh, because we were busy, you know, cutting up and cleaning up the area, and the Mike Force was doing patrolling and so on and so forth. Uh, Mike Force had a cook, and every couple of days he would make croissants. <laughs> okay, delicious. <coughs> um, and so um, we, uh, they were there about two weeks, and uh, then they left, and it's up to us to continue clearing the area and uh, doing our own patrolling. By the way, I had a lightweight um, nylon hammock, and that's what I slept in for three months. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so... Uh, 
we go out. I do my first patrol, um, and uh, I don't know if you guys did it, but we took uh, slices of C4, rolled it into a little uh, little ball, uh, put a cup over it, filled the canteen cup, lit it. It burned it. I don't know, 800, 900, and the water would boil, <laughs> you know, almost instantly, and make a coffee. And I'm doing that, and shots ring out, man. And we got some incoming last four, five, ten minutes. I don't know. You don't know. And then it stops. They take off, and everybody's fine. So I get my CIB. Okay. Well, um, we finished the camp in 90 days. We Could I ask you what? Yes, sir. Where was the camp located? Where is this? In it's in Binh Long Province. Mm -hmm. It's uh, east of Shantan, which is off of Highway 13, between Highway 13 and the Songbei River. Mm -hmm. In Three Core. In Three Core, mm -hmm. yes, sir. Okay. Um, south of Anlock, which is the province capital, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, yes. Um, so uh, we finish it off. We had uh, two engineers had come in to help us. They had a front loader that uh, they used to dig the trenches. Uh, we built team houses and so on and so forth. Uh, we finish up the camp 90 days. Everybody's patting us on the back. Great job. Uh, <coughs> in comes General Westmoreland. Now it's a big deal. <laughs> said, how do we get on his radar? But yeah, he came in. Stood in formation, shook our hands, you know, whatever, and he leaves. He's happy. Captain Horn is happy. Uh, great. Um, <clears throat> we had one of the companies we had was a religious sect called Kaudai. This was an offshoot of Buddhism, Catholicism, Taoism, and so on and so forth. <coughs> they and the uh, Vietnamese didn't get along. Um, and the Vietnamese tried to rip them off of some payroll, <coughs> and <clears throat> excuse me, they uh, the Vietnamese counterpart um, jailed two of them, built a, built a little jail, threw these guys in it. And the rest of their troops, we heard, were going to attack and kill <laughs> the Vietnamese. We couldn't let this happen, obviously. So. <clears throat> We had some choppers come in, and we flew these guys out of there real quick. Um, but it was uh, quite an, you know, we were a little bit nervous because uh, who knows what could have happened. Um, dry season comes, and our, our um, well dries up. So uh, we had a water buffalo, and we would send a working party down to the local river to fill it up and bring it back. And during this time, I had asked the C team, can you find me a cook? Because we're starving. <laughs> okay, absolutely starving. <coughs> the, water, the water party goes, get ambushed. Six, four of them get killed to live. <coughs> they, uh, they build uh, four coffins. <coughs> and so happens, they find a cook. They fly him in the next day. Cook gets out of the helicopter, sees the coffins, turns around, gets back in the helicopter. He leaves. We're starving. How can he do this? So um, anyway, uh, the next thing that happens is Colonel Kelly himself decides to visit. And he comes in, and uh, Horn was out on operation, so I got a brief Kelly. Um, I'm, pretty nervous about that. And Kelly has a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Feistenheimer with him. He looked exactly like his name. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Okay. I learned, learned he's the hatchet man. Okay. Uh, and so I brief him. Uh, he flies off. A week later, Feistenheimer comes back. So this is May of 60, 67, right? Yeah. And uh, Feistenheimer comes back. We all get reassigned. Now, we have been there since <coughs> um, early, late December, early January, so we're there five months. Morale is pretty low. Um, and um, Horn is assigned to uh, command a, uh, a Mike Force a team, a team, 
I get uh, assigned to the B team in ANLOC as the uh, intelligence officer, S2. Okay. I go off to uh, S2 and I find out I have a recon platoon. Yay! I finally made it. I got a recon platoon, right? Uh, and uh, uh, went out a couple of times with them. Nothing happened. Uh, the commander was Major Ronnie Mendoza. And after 45 days or so, he comes and he says, I'm reassigning you. You're taking over as commander of Minton, A332, Special Forces Camp. Oh, great. I mean, because being Special Forces and being an A-team commander is the premier job. You know, that's the great job. Off to Minton. Uh, let me tell you something about Minton. It had been built in 64. It had two water-filled moats, uh, lots of barbed wire. Um, it had a f about 400 CIDG indigenous troops, three companies Cambodian, one company Vietnamese, and one Cambodian recon co uh, platoon. We had uh, a 50, big 50 cal machine gun raised, not authorized. Had a 57 recoilless rifle, not authorized. We had, uh, I had uh, M1 uh, carbines for trading, not authorized. I had uh, four 81 millimeters cool, four, 4.2, not authorized. And by the way, I had a, uh, a Vietnamese civilian named Chang, who had been trained by the Japanese in World War II, <laughs> was in the Vietnamese Army, and he was, he uh, trained these water crews, really good. <coughs> um, I also had a couple of extra M60s because I took the carbines and I would trade them with helicopter pilots because they had 38s and I'd give them the carbines for one of their M60s. <coughs> <coughs> Don't ask me how they explained it. <coughs> I have no idea. So I had extra. When you know it, we get a, we get a message um, you're going to have an IG inspection. I said, what idiot spent his night taking in the middle of a war zone we're going to have an IG inspection? This is beyond, beyond the pale. Well, first thing we had to do was hide everything. Uh, a major and an E-7 fly in and uh, they're there about 45 minutes, and I run out to the major, and I said, hey, we got a slight problem. I just got intelligence <coughs> that there's a North Vietnamese regiment in the area. We're preparing for an attack. <coughs> <coughs> I suggest you tell your pilot to go, and we'll call him when you're ready. He had a better idea. He says, I'm going too. <laughs> so, <laughs> he leaves. <laughs> I never heard from him again. <laughs> there goes my IG inspection. Um, talk about warning orders. We got a warning order, um, a flash order, that um, we were we should prepare for attack. There was an overflight. Uh, they took photos, and they saw um, some mortars, mortar rounds stacked up at the far end of our runway with some uh, pillboxes or something, and. Uh, Okay, I had no information on that. I said, I, I don't believe this, you know. Uh, we had some local intel and uh, we had patrols out. I don't think so. So, um, next day uh, we get a message, a hel helicopter incoming with a one star. Oh. Well, it's the assistant division commander of the 1st Infantry Division, which had oversight on Bin Long Province, and he gets out, comes to, I drive down here, he comes to the Jeep. <clears throat> he said, we had this photos and so on and so forth. <coughs> I said, sir, I don't think so. Why don't you get in the Jeep, we'll drive down and we'll take a look. <laughs> he says, I got a better idea. I got a battery, battery of 105s and a battalion flying in here in about a half hour. <laughs> okay, goodbye. <laughs> okay. He takes off. And I'm saying, oh, great, you know, I got, I got a source of some food coming in here, you know. <laughs> so I was happy. And uh, sure enough, battery is lifted in. 
all these helicopters, more helicopters I've ever seen in my life come flying in with a battalion. And they were nice enough to allow me to put one of my companies interspersed with them so they could learn how these guys did their patrolling. They were there maybe an hour, to my chagrin, off they go, no food. Uh, so, <coughs> um, anyway, can we cut one second so I can... Uh, <coughs> on camera. So one of the great things about being special forces is the only people that ever helped you were you. You know, it's not like you can call up the local whatever and get some help. Uh, <coughs> so you had to be able to figure out things on your own. For instance, <coughs> one day outside our front gate is a whole lord of local um, people. We had a village not far away of about a thousand people and they're out there not happy. I have a couple come in, what's the matter? <coughs> Your helicopter flew over our fields and uh, killed 18 water buffalo. Now I couldn't say, what do you mean my helicopter? <laughs> you know, because I was no different than the guys flying a helicopter, right? Um, what would you have done? <laughs> okay. okay, what do you do? So I said, uh, I need to buy time. Go out and bring me back 36 ears. Okay. Uh, and they go off, I call the B team. Hey, I got this problem, what do I do? We'll call the C team. Have you heard from the C team? Because I never heard back from the C team. So they come back, sure enough, 36 years, and I call them in. <coughs> I was thinking, well, how much is a water buffalo? 200 bucks. I said, done. I get $3,600 and I pay them. Now, where did I get $3,600? Well, every month a paymaster came in and I had a budget of 25000 a month. I used that to pay the troops. I used that to buy food for them. I had a supplier, Chinese guy out of Saigon. Once a month, he would load up a caribou or 130 or 123 with live pigs, ducks, chickens, fruit, vegetables, whatever. We had rice. I had as much rice as I needed. They'd fly in. I had, uh, we had a, a, a kitchen, cooks that prepared the food and paid them. Uh, I had a, <clears throat> a small budget for local intel and then there was a little left over. That was my uh, slush fund. So that's where I got my 3600 um, And um, <clears throat> anyway, paid them. So other unexpected things. <coughs> <coughs> was uh, I get invited for lunch at the Buddhist temple. Oh, great. Uh, so I get an interpreter, we go to the Buddhist temple and uh, walk in and there's eight or nine monks sitting on the floor, a couple of local dignitaries, I guess, the mayor, I sit down. Uh, I don't know what they fed me. I didn't ask. I, <laughs> I didn't want to know. Uh, and after they start talking and the interpreter is telling me what they're talking about and I realize and I start laughing inside because I, I couldn't start, I couldn't laugh. You know. It's a fundraiser for, for the Buddhist temple. The only thing missing was the from the thermometer, you know, you know outside. <laughs> anyway, they start talking. <laughs> All of a sudden, they look at me, and my interpreter says, uh, Okay, Dai Wee, what are you going to do? <laughs> I said, Here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to give you 10 bags of rice, 50 pound bags. I have some building materials I'm going to do, and I'm going to give you 50 bucks. I don't know whether I was a hero or not, but I got up and I left, and I guess they seemed satisfied, and that's how I handled that situation. Uh, talking a little bit about religion, uh, one Sunday a chaplain decides to fly in. Lieutenant Colonel, he flies in, meet him, and he says, I'm here to conduct services. I said, well, let me tell you the rules of my camp. I said, one thing, you have to bring us something that the team can use before you can do your service. Uh, and if you do, 
even though I'm Jewish, I will be up front and I will pray like hell. Okay. Thank you very much. See you later. Okay. Three weeks later, he comes back. He's got a box of kittens. And uh, we had a rat problem. You know, you heard the rats at night on the, on, the, on the roofs and so on and so forth. Kittens come in. The sounds start to dissipate. The cats are doing their thing. And after a week or 10 days, the noise starts coming back. The troops thought cats were delicacies, and they're eating the cats. <laughs> there goes the cats. There goes the... <laughs> uh, the last religious thing was in September of 67, Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, which is the most religious holiday. And I get a, I get a, a note from uh, one of the uh, st staff of the C team inviting me to join him to go to Saigon to fly in a Jewish rabbi. And he says, come up to Benoit, where the C team was, and then the next day we'll drive into Saigon. It's 15 miles or something. Okay. And I had heard that now Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Swift is stationed at uh, Benoit. And uh, I said, great, I can go and catch up with him. So <clears throat> I fly up there. Uh, I find his headquarters, walk into the day room. Sergeant E-9 is behind the desk, looks at me like, well, what, are you, what are you doing here, you know? And I said, is uh, Colonel Swift here? Yes, sir. Excuse me? Tell that motherfucker to get out here. Well, he's astonished. He couldn't, be he couldn't believe it. <laughs> his jaw drops. Uh, sir? I said, tell that to get out right now, Sergeant. And he gets up, runs down the hall, first office, pops us, and he says, Colonel, there's a crazy captain out there. He wants to see you. Okay. Swifty comes out, looks at me, and he says, Schachter, what have they done to you? <laughs> and the juxtaposition of my old instructor, who's looking at somebody who almost flunked out or kicked out of <laughs> uh, school there, <coughs> or OTC, and now he's looking at me, I got my beret, I got my Airborne Ranger patch, I got, you know, uh, jump wings, CIB, Vietnamese jump wings, uh, he's astonished, <laughs> okay, and uh, we go have coffee and we have great laughs, he was, uh, he was it was fun, okay. Uh, so I will meet another person in, from my past shortly. So I, I um, <clears throat> after that I go back to the C team, um, have dinner, and go to the officer, uh, officer um, uh, NCO club. They didn't have enough of either, so they had me a joint club. And I'm standing at the bar having a beer. There's a little bandstand, and uh, band start. No, music starts. Stripper comes out. I said, I thought we were in a war. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Standing near me is a civilian. And uh, after she finishes, I start chatting with these guys. He's Australian. He's her manager. So I hire her to come out to my camp. Now, my wife does not want me to tell the rest of the story. It's classified. But... I rain. She comes out about a week later. Okay. Uh, next day, I go to Saigon and uh, go to the auditorium, and there's 30 or 40 remps. I'm sure you know what the remps are. Rear echelon, okay, in there. And uh, I walk in with this other captain, and I mean, they, they looked at me like we had just walked off the moon or something, you know. Like, this guy is Jewish. <laughs> okay. And uh, I sit in the back, rabbi does his thing, and uh, after service, <coughs> everybody stand up and introduce themselves. Comes to me, I stand up, I said, I'm Captain Schachter, stationed 50 kilometers north of here. On the way in, they had stacked up all kinds of Jewish food, uh, kosher salamis and gefilte fish and challah bread and, you know, and I said, 
By the way, I'm taking all the food. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I go, I go back to the table. There were some bags around. I took as much as I could. Um, you should have seen my troops eating kosher food. <laughs> okay. This was, a, this was a sight for sore eyes. Okay. They loved it. Okay. Because we're starving. Speaking of starving, we got a hold of a cow. Don't ask me how. I don't remember. But one of my NCOs had been a butcher in civilian life. And he says, don't worry, I'm going to take the cow, put it in one of the areas, and we'll just feed it for a couple of weeks, get it nice and plump, and we're going to have some steaks. Wow, great. So a couple of weeks go by, time to do the cow in, you know. And uh, he goes up to the cow with M16, shoots the cow in the head, and the cow just stands there. What? <laughs> uh, so finally, I take my 45. I shoot the cow. Cow goes down. He uh, he butchers the cow. Well, <clears throat> we didn't know until we tried it. But the cow immediately went in because it didn't die immediately. So it tightens up every muscle. Could not eat this meat. <laughs> Could not eat it. <laughs> it's too tough. <coughs> there goes. There goes our. Steaks and chops. Well, <clears throat> okay. I then get an order to go up to Natrang to interview to be the uh, uh, assistant controller of Special Forces. I was one of four or five junior officers that had a business degree. And uh, I fly up there and I find the controller's office. I walk in and who's sitting there? Major Suit M. Jew, J-E-W. I said, but Jew, I'm the Jew. <laughs> we had a laugh. And I'm figuring, you know, maybe whoever decided to give him off, off orders for that looked at his name and said, Jew, he must know <laughs> how to do this stuff. Uh, anyway, the job as assistant controller, they had a $90 million budget in 1967 and help administer it. And I said... Thank you very much. Uh, we know each other too well, and I'm really happy heading up an A-team. So thank you, but no thanks. And I go back to my camp. Um, I, I learned that in um, Michelin Rubber Plantation, which was southwest of us, uh, was the 25th Infantry Division, a brigade. And they had there, uh, from time to time, uh, 175 self-propelled howitzers. And I believe the max range of a 175 was about 25 or 30 clicks. And my camp was at the far end of that. And I said, well, if I really get into trouble and I need some final fires, I'm going to call these guys in because they, this, you know, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. I might as well <coughs> be for my own guys, you know. So <coughs> I'm in the uh, in the talk. Uh, brigade commander's there, full colonel. Um, there's a battery commander. I think he's a major lieutenant colonel. And they want uh, a ten ten words, uh, a ten letter word. No two letters the same, because they would take the letters, put a number to them. First letter would be one, last letter would be zero, and you could put in. You'd say I'm at. M05, you know, what M0, whatever. What is your uh, 10 words? I said, motherfucker. <laughs> Excuse me. And they looked at me, and they have a grease pencil out, and they start writing this. <laughs> okay. And then one guy takes a piece of paper, it takes a tape and tapes it so it's covering <laughs> my, my word. Okay. Don't have a sense of humor, these guys, obviously. <laughs> so uh, fly back to my camp, and unfortunately, I get out of the helicopter, and uh, it takes off and crashes. Um, we didn't hear it crash, didn't know it had crashed, um, until we got a call about an hour later, have you seen the cut chopper? Yeah, and they saw the search. And I identify it maybe a quarter of a mile away from the camp, from where it took off. 
And apparently it's uh, the uh, what do you call it? propeller in the back fell off. And it had didn't, couldn't order rotate and, and bad things happened, hit the ground, burned up because it's magnesium. Um, and so uh, once they identified the position, I took a couple of guys, no place to land. We fast roped in to <coughs> <coughs> secure the area until they could send in some folks to uh, cut open a, you know, a landing zone and bring some other people in, and they did that, and then I take off. Uh, so that was one close call. Another close call was that I was out with uh, about 90 of my troops. Uh, we were doing our mission, and we would do a mission every three days. I was in normal rotation, so whenever my term came up, I would go out. And we're in file, walking along. We hear a forward air control overhead. And uh, next thing I know, he puts a marking round rocket. 200 meters to our front, line of march. And I know what's coming next, you know. Uh, F-4s are coming in. And so I tell my troops, just stop, be quiet, don't move. You got the FAC up there. Sure enough, fast movers come in, uh, and they come in back to front and start bombing. Well, if they had dropped short, no bill, <laughs> sure, okay. Uh, but fortunately, they didn't, and so we escaped that. Never found out who the fact was, and uh, that was just a, a, a lucky time that I had. Um, I had um, one KIA, sorry to say, and uh, he went out, and it was somewhat his fault and the other American with him because... Our SOP was, at the end of the day, when you get your last meal, and it's E-E-N-T, end of evening, nautical twilight, just dusk, you move, find another location in case you've been followed. Okay. Well, they didn't do that, and they had been followed, and uh, BC had uh, focused in on one of the Americans, blew him away, dies. Um, the uh, next thing is I had one MIA. It's an interesting story. Uh, guy's name was uh, Sergeant Stephen Geist, G-E-I-S-T. And Stephen had come to us from another team. He was pretty new. About a week in, uh, we had planned a Helleborn operation. Uh, and... <clears throat> uh, a FAC had flown in, and I told the FAC, would you take him up let him go see where the LZ is, because all we had a Mac recon, and that is the maps aren't always accurate. Let's see if that area is okay, and then fly him around the uh, the AO, which was I don't know, 450, 500 square miles. Uh, and so he, he takes off. 15 minutes, 10 minutes later, this is quarter nine. I hear he calls and he, he said, "I see some civilians in the area. They're okay." Never heard from him again. Nothing, no radio calls, no nothing, and uh, just disappears. So, <clears throat> you know, I start calling around about ten thirty, and where are these guys? They should be back. Nobody, nobody had heard from them. Um, you know, we uh, we reached out to his command, and uh, about one o'clock started a search, and I got on one of the copper choppers. We flew around. Couldn't find anything. Had a big search. A lot of a lot of planes, helicopters. Nobody found anything. Three days, called off the search. <coughs> and um, this story continues thirty years later. All right. Anyway, I'll keep going for my Vietnamese part of the story. Um, so I'm getting down to uh, Deros date which was December 9th. I arrived December 10, 1966, and I got no orders. Uh, a week out, I had no orders, and I, had, I was due to go on a patrol. I went on this patrol. 
uh, three days. The last night I had slept in, a, we found a Vietnamese, an NVA bunker complex. We slept in those. Uh, I finally got orders, I don't know, three or four days before my zero, 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 zero date. And my orders were from Department of Army. Uh, they're sending me to Dahlonega, Georgia, instructor, mountain ranger training. Now, I don't know if you know anything about Dahlonega, Georgia. It's pretty close here, okay. Uh, in those days, uh, I think the town maybe had 800 people. I'm 25 years old, you know. What am I going to do in a town of 800 people? <laughs> you know, I do not want to do this. Okay. Anyway, I go home. Um, didn't run into any protesters when I when I flew. I flew into uh, uh, San Francisco, stayed overnight. Next day, fly to New York. Mother, sister-in-law pick me up. Have a you know, finally get to eat. And uh, next morning, my my mother walks into the room. Now I'm wired, even <laughs> I mean, I'm still wired, right? Uh, and I hear her, you know, and I'm jump out of bed, yelling, "Yeah!" <laughs> you know, she she screams, "Ah!" <laughs> Runs out of the room. Uh, so. I'm home, and everybody wants to know, why are we in Vietnam? And I spent a week talking to people, and then I decided, ah, enough of this. I went back to Aspen to ski for a week, and then uh, driving down to Dahlonega, Georgia, I stopped in the Pentagon to see my career counselor. He's a major, leg major and uh, ash and trash. And he says, well, here's the deal. Um, you're going to Dahlonega, it's a critical assignment. You're there 18 months. And by the way, you're a five percenter. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, you, you are, uh, after that, you are going back to Vietnam. You'll be a company commander, probably an airborne company, um, because you need command time. I said, wait a minute. I just had almost a battalion-sized group. I had a budget of 25000 uh, I want to go to Germany. <laughs> okay. Why are you doing this to me? Well, that's the orders. I said, well, I'll probably get out. He says, well, if you get out, you get out. I said, are you kidding me? I said, you spend a lot of money training me and getting me to where I am. You just say, get out. He says, yeah, you can get out. Uh, so I, uh, I went to uh, Dahlonega, Georgia. The good thing about it was that I, I sympathize with these kids that uh, got out of Vietnam, landed, and were civilians the next day. This, was a, this is a crime um, that they could, you know, there's no time for them to decompress. Um, and. Uh, so in Dahlonega, I had everybody there was a Vietnam vet, you know, um, and uh, lots of stories back and forth. And um, October 68, I said, I'm out of here. I'm going. Uh, and frankly, I thought I'd get killed. I said, I'm too lucky. I'm going to get killed if I go back. <coughs> Number two. I've never been in a regular army unit. I don't know if uh, the commanders and so forth could put up with me. I mean, I'm kind of off the wall, if you will. <laughs> you know? So uh, I decided to get out. Uh, as I mentioned uh, to you, I, a year later I joined the reserves and I joined the uh, National Guard. I was in three different units over the next six or seven years. But I want to finish up, and let's see how much time, and I'll write that, with Geist. Unusual things happen. Thirty years later, um, I get a call that Geist's ex-sister-in-law was very much involved with MIA POW stuff. In fact, she was in Georgia. 
and uh, she'd like to talk to you because his parents are getting old and they want to know what really happened. And I said, oh my God, uh, I, I can't imagine all these years. They think there was some other thing that went on, you know, and they're holding this. This is what they're holding on to. <coughs> Um, and uh, I had spoken to his father when I got back. First thing I did was call his dad, tell him how sorry he was, and told him the circumstances of what happened. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I said to her, you know, 30 years, he's dead. You know, let's not mince words, he's dead. Well, she put me in touch with the folks at the Pentagon that are involved in the coordination with the uh, MIPOW uh, group, the families. And uh, over time, I talked to uh, many of the officers there. And then uh, a real strange thing happened. Uh, they did a PowerPoint presentation. Somebody did a PowerPoint presentation on Sergeant Stephen Geist. And they asked me to look at it. I look at it. And uh, some things were accurate, some things other. But in the presentation, it said at 10.30 a.m. on September, whatever the date is. Now, he had left 8.45. At 10.30, he called the air controller and gave a position. Uh, I'm going, wait a minute. Uh, I, I never heard of this. This is very new. And I had taken my field map and I had uh, mounted it, I had framed it, mounted it, and I go over to see the, look at these coordinates, my jaw drops, uh, five clicks from my camp. I said, Jesus, if I had known this at that time, uh, we, we would have gone out and searched. Uh, so uh, I said, well, so uh, I went on Google Earth. Uh, the whole place had changed. Uh, the runway was gone, uh, the old camp was gone, no references. Um, and uh, I decided, I had seen on a History Channel or something like that, a documentary about guys that had gone back searching. So I decided I'm going to do a documentary and go find this guy. Uh, and I call around to people I know, and uh, they call around to people they know, and I find a documentary film producer. Uh, I'm living in Charlotte, and I fly up to New York, and uh, I go sit with him. Um, and uh, he likes the story. He wants to do this. Okay. <coughs> <clears throat> now, you don't get any help from the Department of Army to do this. Uh, I was very excited about this whole thing, this whole project. Uh, but then I said, you know, I, I don't even know where to start because Google Earth, you can't, there's no reference points here. So uh, he said, I just need a half a million <laughs> to fund this. I said, well, that's uh, 495,000 more than I can put up, okay. And uh, anyway, that goes by the boards, I'm sorry to say. And I'm convinced that even if I had gone back, I would no way I could have figured out where to go and so on and so forth. But uh, that was, uh, you know, an incredibly strange story that took place over a couple of years. Uh, I even went to the Pentagon, I think in about 212, 213, and sat with these guys. And they have um, reports, mostly unconfirmed reports, about people seeing captured Americans or downed aircraft and stuff like that. And I sat with them. <clears throat> they spread out a whole bunch of maps, you know, and they're showing me this one there. This. I said, well, none of this is where I would put this airplane. It doesn't make sense in my mind that he would go over there, we would go over there. Uh, you, you're wasting your time with this, going after this guy. There's other people, obviously, you're looking for. Uh, last thing I heard from them was about three or four years ago that uh, they had a report from uh, some medical people that had been in a uh, buried hospital in uh, Warzone Sea and had come out for smoke, saw a plane crash, 
um, gave me the coordinates. I said, well, that, that kind of makes sense where that is. Uh, and he said they had examined it, they were dead, they took the flak jackets. I said, this doesn't compute. We didn't have flak, flak jackets, never wore one, didn't have them, you know. So uh, that's the last uh, I ever heard about that, uh, that deal. Um, Can I ask you, is he still considered an MIA to this day? KIA. KIA. Yes, oh, they, KIA. Yes, they okay. yes. they, right. they changed it many years ago to KIA uh, status, um, even though he's missing in action. But uh, there's no other conclusion you can make after all this time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they told me, you know, there is, you know, they coordinate with the North Vietnamese. He said, in their minds, there's no POW still there. Uh, in captured status or anything else, um, uh, it was an eye, it was an eye opener, um, and so finally, let me get back to joining. After a year being a civilian, joining the 19th Special Forces Group, headquarters and headquarters company uh, reserves, and uh, so I joined this outfit. Um, and uh, I don't know if I even told my ex-wife, but uh, I'm, I'm home taking a shower and I get a call. She says, uh, Sergeant so-and-so is on the phone. Now, she knows nothing about the military and Sergeant so-and-so wants Captain Schachter. You know anything about this? I said, I don't know. So I get him, he says, uh, you know, there's a mail strike. We've been activated. <laughs> the mail strike. Oh, okay. Report in tomorrow eight. Okay. So I go to Miller Army Airfield, Staten Island, and uh, we sit around for the day, do nothing. Why are we sitting around? Because they were afraid that troops showing up with Green Berets would antagonize the strikers, of all things. <laughs> okay. So um, the next day we go, they send us to a big mill facility on 8th Avenue, New York City, near Madison Square Garden. Uh, they had 11 trucks to be unloaded. They tell us it takes um, four or five days. We finished in one day <laughs> doing it. Finally, uh, three or four days go by. They settle the mail strike and, uh, okay. Uh, Anyway, uh, back to the 19th Special Forces Group, um, and um, uh, it wasn't ultimately like a cup of tea because most of these guys were airborne guys, and because they were airborne, they could join Special Forces, but they weren't really Special Forces guys. So, for instance, when we uh, arrived in Saturday Sunday morning, we had a stand in formation. What is this stand in formation stuff? You know, this doesn't compute. Uh, <coughs> anyway, we had a parting of the ways after two years. Uh, I went to two summer camps. One was uh, in Edwards Air Force Base up on Cape Cod. Uh, the other was at uh, uh, Camp Cam uh, Campbell, Kentucky. Uh, we did a fun thing. We jumped out of 141, uh, which is cool. Um, and there was a gentleman in the group named Bob Morosco. You can Google Bob Morosco. Bob Morosco was the, you've heard the expression, uh, eliminate with extreme prejudice. Bob Morosco ran an agent, and he was special forces, he was intelligence detailed special forces, and he was running agents cross-border into Cambodia. One of his agents, they found out, was a triple agent. Bob Morosco took him out. They gave him a sedative, shoots him in the head, loaded, <laughs> weighted him, throws him into Natrang Harbor. Uh, the guy had a relative that was uh, in government. And the relative starts complaining to the Army, and uh, General Abrams gets a hold of this. Well, the regular army were not big fans of special forces in those days, especially Creighton Abrams. 
And so he figured, I got a way to get these guys, I, I guess. And so uh, they wind up arresting Colonel Rowe, commander of Special Forces, uh, and a couple of uh, the staff guys, and Bob Morosco, and throw them into Ben Long Jail. Um, and uh, uh, they got a lawyer in New York named Henry Roth. He wrote a book. Um, and uh, you can Google Bob Morasco, you can Google this, and you can read the story. Ultimately, um, they let him out because they knew too much <coughs> about covert special forces operations. You know, guys going into Cambodia with the Delta uh, stuff and that kind of stuff. So uh, they let him go. And anyway, Bob was a guy that I met, interesting guy. Ultimately, we had a parting of the ways, and I had, uh, I had uh, met, uh, anyway, I went to uh, 19th Special Forces Group, uh, and I got an A-team. And I spent, I don't know, a year plus, and we were going for summer camp out to Utah. And uh, the, the uh, XO was a major, one of these airborne guys that was pretending to be Special Forces, and gave us a choice. You could either go with a 45 if you're an officer or an M16. It wasn't a big choice to me. I'm taking my 45, you know. And he puts out an edict. Uh, you have to attach the 45 to your person. Uh, I said, what? <laughs> I think I'm a responsible guy. What is he talking about, you know? We fly out to Utah, and um, I, uh, I took 45 feet of parachute cord. I wrapped it around my head. I attached one end to the butt of the 45 and the other to myself. And I'm walking around hoping to piss off that major, which I did. It's very successful at doing that. Uh, so I, uh, and finally, uh, the Colonel, Colonel Harrington, comes and says to me, okay, Schachter, you made your point. Do me a favor, you know, get rid of this, which I did. Um, there were 26 A-teams from around the country there, and we had to do uh, Army training tests, ATT. And we were, being, we were jumping into Montana, night jump, uh, and getting tested. <coughs> you know, and a couple teams get on the, the 130, and uh, we had a general from the National Guard was there, from the New York National Guard came with us. You know, I guess he wanted to get his jollies to watch this. And uh, we had, I had a regular Army E-7, and we jump out, form up. Um, well, there's nothing an E-7 knew that I didn't know plus. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I train Rangers. I, you know, been inspired. I mean, you know, so I know every, I know all the tricks and trade. And uh, uh, of 26 teams, six passed. I was one of them. <coughs> the last day of this, we accomplished our mission that we had, um, which was blowing up a, uh, a silo. Uh, we planted blocks and so forth. And the last day we were being uh, helicopter uh, uh, lifted out, and I knew that they were trying, going to trick us, that that helicopter is going to come in and try to blow the out of us. And so we hide inside. The helicopter comes in, and uh, he gets there. I guess they know what to do. He starts firing, you know, blanks. And <coughs> ha, 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 we leave. You know, we're all right, you know. And so uh, we go out to the road. I guess the town we had to go to was 10 miles away. And a truck comes along. We hitchhike and <laughs> get in the back of the truck and get to this town. Helena, Montana was where we had to go. So um, we get there and fine. Um, anyway, my company transfers me to Los Angeles. And uh, the... Uh, Special Forces there uh, didn't have, uh, they had an opening, but 
it was uh, S3, and it was too busy. <coughs> so he wrote me, he wrote a letter. I hope I have it. On my behalf. And he says, I have just retired after nine years as commander, 3rd Battalion, 19th Special Forces Group, Airborne, New York, Air, uh, Army National Guard. I have had over 16 years of special forces duty, served in unconventional warfare stability duties prior to that. During this service, I cannot remember encountering an officer who performed better than Captain William Schachter. He certainly ranks among the outstanding officers I have known and without a doubt was one of the best, if not the best, of the officers I commanded. I am most concerned about his capabilities will be lost to the military service in general and to special forces in particular through want of a position vacancy now that he is relocated from this area. Any of those who can aid in assigning him to an appropriate position can be assured they will be rewarded with loyal, energetic, intelligent, spirited, imaginal leadership on his part. This officer intelligently would make commandos out of the post garbage detail. Let's all help he finds a position with more scope. He's one of the best. So I didn't join uh, the Special Forces out there. I joined the uh, Infantry Battalion, 40th Division, Mechanized Infantry Division, uh, California National Guard. And uh, I was, uh, they appointed me as the S2 of the battalion. <clears throat> And from time to time, we would go to Fort Irwin, which is in the desert, and they prearranged tracks for us so we could go out and maneuver around and so on and so forth. And uh, I did not like wearing a helmet. I did not like cutting my hair. Uh, and, uh, and so if I wasn't riding in the track, I would put the helmet in the crook of my elbow. And, uh, you know... Uh, my battalion commander uh, was a captain in, in the uh, police force. Uh, he again, he liked my act. Uh, so he didn't say anything, let me do it. Anyway, one day uh, I'm out watching, um, watching these guys train and a uh, brigadier general shows up, comes, gets out of his staff car and I have my helmet, I have my afro, okay. And I go up and I salute him. And he salutes back and he's looking at my head like this. And then he looks down and he sees all the stuff. Takes his helmet off and puts it in a crook of it. <laughs> and we start to chat. Okay. Psychology, right? Uh, on another occasion, um, they woke us up at 10 o'clock at night. Again, we were out in the desert. I think we were there for summer camp. And um, they wake us up to do a briefing. And uh, I had, I went to the briefing. I had uh, sneakers. Uh, I had a T-shirt with a flag of Poland. And <laughs> I went to do this briefing. Now, I knew how to brief. I was good at this stuff. And I knew that during a briefing, I would leave out some obvious points so that when somebody wanted to gotcha, I would jump down his throat. And after I did that the first time, never got a question after that, you know. So I uh, finished the briefing, and uh, these couple of colonels go up to my commander, and he says, what's with this guy? You know, he's got this and that. He says, ah, he's just an old snake eater. We just leave him alone. <laughs> okay. uh, the last thing I'm going to do, which I forgot to do, was to read the letter I got from Robert Frechet, who was my commander at basic training. Uh, and I think this encapsulates a lot about me. And so I was leaving, and I did get um, a little uh, gift. I got a... Uh, uh, a um, little mounted bulldog with a uh, sign over it, smoke em. <laughs> I was not an easy guy, okay. And they loved me, but I was not an easy guy with the troops. And he says uh, to Lieutenant William D. Schachter, it is customary that when an officer leaves this command, 
he be given a letter of appreciation or depreciation, whichever is applicable. Of course, in your case, the latter is clearly applicable. It was noted throughout the period in question that you were occasionally on time for Reveille formation. Your personal appearance was unusual. The haircut, or rather lack of it, bloodshot eyes, dirty patrol cap were only redeemed by your airborne and ranger tab. <coughs> As training... <coughs> <coughs> As training officer, you kept your commanding officer in a constant state of agitation and succeeded on numerous occasions of bringing down the wrath of higher, higher. On one memorable occasion, no less than the birthday of the army, you failed to say grace where it promptly reigned. Socially, you were perhaps a menace of the first order, though as no one can prove it. It has been alleged that several innocent sweet young things have undergone remarkable changes after they being associated with you. As company executive officer, you failed to impress upon your troops in the CO's absence the proper military spirit, not that swagger stick, sunglasses, and pretensions of grandeur didn't fit in this picture. It's just that they belong to another picture entirely. Without question, your, your appearance, unusual training theories, lack of tact, and tainted personal life will truly be the man to watch in special forces. My happiness in first meeting you in the company is exceeded only by your leaving it. P.S. Your 208 papers have been forwarded to your next CEO. <laughs> Thank you very much. This has been very a great, good. great pleasure. I, I do have a couple sure. quick follow-up questions. Um, you had quite a diverse experience in Vietnam. And, uh, and what you managed and what you commanded there. Um, of all your experiences of what you went through in Vietnam, what's probably the most significant thing that uh, you saw or witnessed to or impacted you, and how did it impact you in your life, particularly today? I think the most significant thing was the ability to uh, get things done when there was no FM to tell you what to do. <coughs> you know, coming up with solutions to problems that, are, that arose <coughs> was, um, I don't know that you can teach this. You have to have a certain feel for what to do, what may work, it may fail, but you got to try, you have to give it a shot. And that stayed with me forever. That's good. So, in, in essence, what you just shared with us has it really made an impact and and helped direct your life after the service. I'm assuming too, correct? Correct. Yes, correct. Very good. Yes. Do you all have uh, any other questions for him at this point? I have one. I'd like to know if you've kept up with your comrades that you served with when you were in the military. Uh, unfortunately, I did not. Um, you know, it wasn't like we were in, uh, you know, I didn't get involved with uh, the associations. Um, I did go to uh, Washington, D.C. when they had the first Veterans March way back. Uh, and um, I was struck by meeting a bunch of guys um, who couldn't let it go. Uh, and they were somewhat traumatized by that. Um, so I, 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 no, I didn't, I didn't keep up. Although today, at uh, two occasions, there's a Zoom meeting of uh, both my uh, uh, teams, not the entire team, but people that served at those locations: A331, A332 which I'm looking forward uh, to having discussions uh, with. Um, so I didn't, I, 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 would, uh, I would like to catch up if I could um, because I have these movies that I took. And uh, if I could uh, get these movies to a couple of these guys, that would be, uh, that would be fun. Uh, and um, so we'll see what happens today. You know? uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. I have just two quick questions. How old were you when you were in Vietnam? 
1967, 66, I was uh, 24, 25 years old. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I got out of the Army in 68, so. Sixty-eight. Yeah, um, I was an old guy, right? You were a young man, <laughs> and then you mentioned how you guys were hungry. What did you eat while you were at while you commanded that camp? Was it sea rations the whole time, or did you ever have a cook? <clears throat> uh, we we uh, we had a lot of beer and cokes. Uh, we had refrigerator freezers. Uh, didn't stock it well. Uh, the uh, and any time we got mortared, which was from time to time, we got shooting scoots in both camps. Uh, the first thing is you run through the refrigerator, grab a beer, and, and go to the bunker. <laughs> uh, and uh, we scrounged for food. Uh, we would go to different um, American companies. Uh, I had uh, boxes of black pajamas. We would take them and give them to the uh, mess sergeant for food, canned good and fresh goods. Um, and, and did that was the main way uh, we found food. Uh, and uh, cooking was, wasn't very good. It was fry, a lot of fried food. Um, we didn't we didn't eat very well. I think that I probably lost thirty pounds. Um, I have in my movies uh, movies of me <laughs> in those days, uh, just skinny as a rail, uh, and uh, but tough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Did you have any? Yes. Sir. Well, we want to tell you. Thank you so much for what you shared with us. You have quite an interesting story. And again, we thank you for taking this time and doing your oral history with us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for your service and welcome home. Yes, thank you. <laughs>